Okay. Welcome everyone to today's Beyond the Scope. Um, it's kind of fun today. Um, we're working with the Microscopy Student Council um, to talk about how to get a job in microscopy. So we've kind of put together a panel today on some different topics with three different speakers. So we'll they're going to be introducing themselves, but I know I wanted to say a couple things first as well. Yeah, I just, hi everyone, I'm Louisa. I'm the current uh, president of the Microscopy Society of America Student Council. It's a mouthful. I just want to give you guys a brief introduction to who we are. Um, first, our uh, parent organization is the Microscopy Society of America. It's a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting and advancing microscopy and microanalysis techniques across all scientific disciplines. The Student Council uh, was established in 2017 as a chapter of the uh, MSA with the same goals in mind, but for our focus, it's on uh, student-specific needs for both technical and uh, professional development. Um, so stay in touch. This is our, um, we have social media platforms we're very active on. If you are familiar with us or not, if you're the least bit curious about microscopy and where that field can take you, uh, we can be reached by email uh, or, or social media. So I'm happy to talk afterwards as well for those in person. Um, that's it, I just wanted to be uh, as brief as possible there. Should we cut to allow all the panelists now? Okay, yeah. So. For today's talks, um, we'll start off with a little bit of um, introduction of the speakers, a little bit about what they look for um, when interviewing different candidates. Um, if you guys have questions during this, I like these to be interactive as well. So if you have questions anytime, feel free to just either raise your hand and we can unmute you for that. Uh, put questions in the Q&A or if you have problems with anything, let us know in the chat and we can set that up as well. So I know we have Help you monitoring what's going on there. I'll try and pay attention to what's going on online as well. So, yeah, we'll go ahead. Um, start. Yeah. We'll start with the Zoom panelists. Yeah. So, um, let's start with Rich. Rich, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit and then um, talk about what you do with everything? Sure. Uh, thank you uh, to MSA Student Council. Uh, I've been a m and attendee and MSA member for many years, going on two decades now. Um, you guys have done a great job with establishing a uh, outreach and central platform to hear the student voices at MSA. At my first conference, I joined uh, m and when at m and I was a student as well. So I just want to say kudos to you guys. You guys have been doing a great job. Um, so everyone's really impressed with the work you're doing. I am I'm currently the program manager uh, for the Materials Characterization Facility at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. I am employed by a private contractor, uh, UES Incorporated. Um, they are a contracting company for the government um, in Dayton, Ohio here. Um, so it's I've been here in this position for about two years now. Um, I was formerly at the University of Alabama. I was the manager of the characterization facility there, the Central Analytical Facility, which is now the Alabama Analytical Research Center. Um, and I spent about 13 years there um, managing the lab. Uh, I originally um, came to the University of Alabama to help Greg Thompson set up uh, the local electrode atom probe um, lab uh, in that characterization facility. Um, and before that, I worked at Amago Scientific Instruments. Um, I was one of Tom Kelly's first hires for developing mm -hmm. the local electrode atom probe microscope. And that's where uh, I began my career um, at the turn of the century, as I like to tell people. So I've been in this um, area for over 20 years now. Um, but uh, Personally, um, I really enjoy uh, microscopy. I remember as a when I was in kindergarten, seeing the weekly reader, there was an image of a fly. It might have been one of David Sharp's images. 
Um, but that was kind of my hook into microscopy at a very young age, seeing that image. Um, the microscopy field, the other thing I love about it, it's a very heavily image um, dependent type of science. So you get to see all the great images I've taken over the years in the presentation that I did not make for this for this event. Um, but it's one of the things I think that attracts everybody to this industry. Um, on a personal level, you know, I enjoy fishing, I enjoy mushroom hunting, I enjoy time at the beach, shore fishing, ice fishing. I'm from Wisconsin originally. Um, and it's really been over the 20 years seeing the development in the microscopy field. Um, even 20 years ago, compared to what's going on now, I think there's still a lot of really interesting work going on. Um, a lot of advancements coming to the field and seeing the whole computer industry and keeping up with the amount of data that's being collected and processed and seeing all the different avenues where we have yet to go yet with analysis, with automation. Um, you know, I think there are so many opportunities out there. So any of these attendees that are looking for a job, you know, the sky's really the limit. And I think you can get into any field, whether it's industry or academia or a government position, if you put your mind to it. Um, and I'll just suggest that a little bit of ambition and um, really goes a long way, uh, showing some initiative and I've got lots of advice, but I hope I didn't go over here in like 10 minutes. I'd like to pass it on and I'll be happy to discuss in more detail um, once we get into the round table. Um, Rich, actually, if you could take just a couple more minutes to, if you're personally involved in uh, some of the hiring at Bright Hat, um, what stands out to you in the candidates who really, uh, really qualify, really uh, are great candidates for the position, and those who might be the opposite? Uh, yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, we had a FIB position open recently. We were looking for a senior level uh, instrumentation specialist, someone that had some years of focused IND beam uh, experience, um, application development. Uh, I thought I would get lots of applicants. I was very surprised that out of the 16 applicants I had, only three of them had the FIB experience. So first of all, it's gonna be the experience that I'm looking for. Um, I know several people who are looking for TM operators for the transmission electron microscope, and they cannot find anybody with a good background in transmission electron microscopy. So, you know, it's it's such a basic thing right now, but I, when I post those positions, I'm looking for that experience. Um, you know, and to the rest of the attendees, whenever you're looking at those job descriptions, the rest of that list, it's a unicorn list, right? You don't have to have everything that's on there. If you, if it says it requires a PhD and you have a master's or a bachelor's degree and you have that experience, you are qualified in my mind for that position. Experience really outweighs most of everything else except personality, attitude, um, showing a little bit of ambition and um, being able to initiate on things. So it's when I'm looking at my candidate list, the first thing that comes is the experience, but it's also their personality, their outgoing, how are they going to fit with the team? Uh, even if I'm putting somebody in a lab where they're going to be by themselves running the instrument, you know, maybe those things don't matter, but having a dynamic ability to talk and communicate talk about your science or talk about who you are, your personality, um, being friendly and outgoing. Um, those are all things I look for in a candidate as well. Um, and as for the unicorn list, if I have five or six requirements on that list, if I'm hitting two or three of them, you know, you are a viable candidate, which still the strongest one in my mind is that experience. So that's what I'm really looking for in a good viable candidate. Okay, thanks, Rich. Um, I'd like to uh, turn now to CJ. Okay. 
All right, good morning, good afternoon uh, to everyone. Uh, first off, I'd like to uh, thank um, the MSA Student Council for seeing this invitation to be a panel member and being a partner with the Fisher Scientific. I've been in the HR industry for over 15 plus years uh, in biomedical, pharmaceutical, manufacturing, and most recently here uh, at Thermal Fisher Scientific. I support the commercial businesses. Uh, one of the many business units that I do support is uh, Material Science Division, uh, also known as uh, Electron Microscopy. Uh, that's where I met um, the, uh, Eliza and, uh, excuse me, Louisa and many others. Uh, that may be attending um, today's call. Um, predominantly, I support mid and senior professional level positions um, and that can range from um, first, second level supervisors to professional positions uh, such as uh, application field uh, engineers, scientists at all levels. Um, I enjoy partnering with our HR business and our and our hiring managers to understand the needs of the business and, de and deliver those quality candidates. Um, I consider my position, what I do for the last 15 plus years as a hobby, I enjoy um, identifying, understanding, and bridging those gaps uh, and, and, and making a partnership between a candidate and, and the company. Um, I, I think of it as, as a marriage. Uh, so, you know, when you apply uh, to the to a position, I think of it uh, uh, of of when I was in uh, when I was younger in, in in fifth grade. We have those little uh, divots <laughs> that you put on your fingers. Do you like me? Yes or no? And yeah, we if we if we like you, yes. And you go through the interviewing process. Second phase of the interviewing process is meeting the family members, and that's going to be the interviewers. Um, and so if you get past the family members and then you go to the final interview, then you're meeting like mom or dad, which maybe could be the, the, the senior director or maybe even a VP, depending on the level of position. And if you get past them, then yes, you're going to get married, which is, a, which is an offer. Um, and so that's kind of like how I foresee the, uh, the process uh, for interviewing. Uh, during my free time, I enjoy CrossFit. I do that about four to five times a week. Uh, traveling uh, globally, anywhere from India to uh, almost everywhere in Europe, uh, and even domestically in the United States. I enjoy, I enjoy riding and working on my Yamaha Raider. I'm a motorcyclist by, by heart. And then most importantly, spending time with family and friends. Um, in, in, in the breakout session that, that we'll have, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this, um, which is being prepared for the interview. Um, and so, you know, in the interviewing process, I do listen for responses in the STAR format. STAR format is situation, task, action, result. Um, I also listen to personal and professional growth and development. Um, what is it that you want to do? Where are you right now? And uh, what positions do we have open that could um, meet your needs and also the business, business's needs? Um, in the breakout session, as I mentioned, I'll discuss how to prep for an interview based on my limited years of, uh, of experience in, in, in human resources. Um, I, can, I, I also would like to say that, uh, and I mentioned this before, is really bridging that gap between the business and delivering on their needs. Um, and then also understanding the candidate's needs because in my role, yes, I do work for a company that's looking for uh, individuals such as you with your skill set to fill those roles, but it's also very important to me to ensure that I understand what you're looking for so then I can put you in or or or, or put you into the right position or connect you with the right hiring manager so that you are going to be successful um, in what you will uh, do uh, in the near future. Um, again, my name is CJ Carl. I work for the Mo Fisher Scientific Senior Talent uh, Acquisition Specialist. Thank you for uh, your time. I look forward to speaking with you during the breakout session. Thanks, CJ. Um, Amanda. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. <laughs> um, 
Hello, uh, I'm Amanda Bruce. Um, I am also uh, with Talent Acquisition with Thermo Fisher. Um, I have been in Talent Acquisition for about 17 years now. Um, just a little of my background professionally. Um, I have been very fortunate to work with some amazing um, organizations before Thermo Fisher as well. Uh, I've built out uh, two uh, recruiting departments from scratch and was able to uh, build out the processes and uh, mentor the recruiters that uh, and uh, sourcers that we hired for the company. Um, I will tell you my absolute favorite, um, what really gets me excited is college recruiting uh, for, you know, and in going into master's and PhD students as well. Um, I've built out two college recruiting programs and that is just where my heart is. Um, I love uh, speaking with college students all the way from freshmen to when they graduate or get their uh, PhD and really helping them and guiding them along the way and um, finding the right opportunity for them, whether that's the company that I am with or um, if, you know, finding out what uh, their career goals and where they want to go in life and helping them, um, you know, set that path. So I'm really passionate about that. So I'm excited to be here. So thank you guys for inviting me to be here. Um, my dad also went to Ohio State, so I've heard my entire life how great uh, Buckeyes are. So uh, very excited to be here. Um, uh, personally, a couple hobbies. Um, I love to travel. Just got back from almost three weeks in Ireland. Had a, an amazing time. Um, I have another hobby. My husband tells me not to tell people because uh, he says that it makes me um, an incredible nerd, but um, I actually uh, show uh, Irish setters. And so, um, so I've been going to dog shows my entire life. I was actually five weeks old, my first dog show. So that's just part of it's in my blood and who I am. So that's my unique hobby. Um, as far as you know, what I'm looking for, oh, um, I've been with Thermo Fisher for about uh, two and a half years now. Um, I love it. Um, this is my home. I cannot see myself going anywhere else. Um, the culture is amazing. Um, the, the room for growth is phenomenal. Uh, the hiring managers that I work with, I, I've never worked with that high of a caliber of managers before uh, coming over to Thermo Fisher. Um, fantastic organization. And again, this is, this is home. Um, I've been very fortunate to also work with uh, one of our microscopy teams um, and uh, be the exclusive recruiter for them. And uh, that is the Nanopore team. Uh, I can tell you that uh, the manager who is leading the America's Nanoport, one of the best managers I've ever worked with in my 17 years. Um, the culture she has created with this team, the support that she gives and you know, leading by example and the other managers uh, with these teams, the teams are broken up into different groups of you know, SEM, TM, cryo, uh, semiconductor. Uh, these managers um, are just, she's been great at duplicating herself. Uh, fantastic, amazing team. And so I'm hoping to uh, maybe eventually talk to some of you guys about opportunities that we have within that team. Um, what we're looking for, uh, obviously, skills first. Um, I will tell you a little trade secret that the average recruiter will look at a resume for about seven seconds. Um, I don't think in this industry that is the case because this is more targeted. Uh, we are looking into more detail on resumes, but that would be my first uh, suggestion um, is to make sure that your resume is prepared for, um, for this specific interview or the position that you're interviewing for. Uh, tailor that resume, make sure you have your skill sets in, uh, that are visible right off the bat. Um, and, uh, you know, make sure that that seven seconds, it's the, the formatting of the resume and where your skills are, make sure that their eyes are drawn to that within those seven seconds. And then, of course, you know, they'll spend more time on that. Um, I spend more time, <laughs> but uh, especially in this industry, uh, but just a little tidbit to know. Um, do your research, um, you know, and, and again, like CJ had mentioned, I'll, I'll I'd be more than happy to talk more about uh, preparing for these interviews, but do your research, know the company, know the, the manager, their manager, look them up on LinkedIn, look at any publications that they have, um, that they've posted, look at the, the company as a whole, um, look at the position, read that job description, make sure your skill set matches that job description, tailor your resume to that job. 
Um, and I agree with Rich 100%. Uh, we do have our unicorn list on there. Apply anyway. Um, that's what we're here for is to look through and see if you have the skills that we're that we're looking for. Um, you know, don't think that you have to check all 10 boxes. If you check six or more, apply anyway. Um, and the great thing about, you know, us in particular um, is if we don't have the right fit for you, we may know of other positions that would be a good fit for, for your skill set. Um, CJ and I share resumes all the time. Um, we work with very similar teams, but a little bit different skill sets. So we, um, we as a team uh, work together and share, uh, share resumes. So um, apply anyway. You never know where, uh, where it'll get you. Um, Again, it just, uh, you know, make sure that you show results. That is, um, you know, part of the STAR method that CJ mentioned. That is something that I really look for. Um, you know, someone who can find a solution, sometimes thinking outside of the box and have results, talk about those results. This is your time to shine. Um, you know, show us that uh, you are capable of, you know, going over and beyond and uh, coming up with those solutions and those results and that, um, you know, that hard work did pay off. Um, I'm trying to think. I have a lot more, but I know this isn't the, uh, the time for that yet, but I'd be more than happy to talk to anybody more on this and resume, uh, preparing your resume. But again, thank you guys so much for inviting me. I'm super excited to be here and uh, can't wait to talk to you guys more. Thanks, Amanda. Um, okay, finally, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, we have a um, associate professor at Ohio, here at Ohio State. So I'm Simon Arkin. I'm an associate professor in biomedical engineering, as Louisa said. I lead the uh, nanocardiology lab. Uh, so by way of a little bit of background, my lab, uh, we are cardiac physiology lab. We try to understand how the heart maintains rhythm, what happens to that rhythm in disease that causes it to fall apart, and we try to find ways of preventing that. But to do that, we take a very microscopy heavy approach, uh, which is why I'm here today. Um, before I talk about what we do, I'll give you a little bit of background from how I got in this situation. So my undergrad was in chemical engineering. Uh, but I did that with the full intent of going into life science. And I just thought, there's too many life scientists in life science. They need something different. And so <laughs> high school me thought that was a good idea. It somehow worked out. Uh, my PhD was in biomedical engineering, but that was all whole heart, uh, high speed imaging and whole heart physiology. I did a brief postdoc in a math department after that, tried to become a computational modeler. Got frustrated because a lot of the structural parameters that I needed for the models weren't available. So out of pure rage, I was like, I'm gonna go become a microscopist and get these values out of the tissue itself. So that's the origin of the lab is me getting irritated as a modeler, not finding enough data, but <laughs> That meant I came to microscopy during my second postdoc. I'd never done any microscopy before that. And the reason I jumped in was that this was uh, 2011, 2012, right when super resolution microscopy was really getting on the map. And I had a problem that fit that tool. It was very much an ideal situation of, hey, this new technology suddenly actually can answer the questions I've got. Let me go learn how to do this. Um, when I showed up and started learning, it was, it was First of all, it was, this speaks to something that um, Amanda and others have already touched on. I was clearly applying to position, so I was like, I'm not a microscopist, but give me a few months and I'll be one. I can learn. And people were willing to take a chance on that, uh, which is why I have my career today. So in addition to that, one of the things I focus on a lot in my lab spends a lot of time on is image analysis. We, again, often find that the image analysis tools don't exist to make the measurements we need, so we build our own. Um, that is something that I've been programming since I was a kid for reasons unknown to me. Uh, I thought I could use programming to design comic books as a fifth grader, but it turns out programming has nothing to do with that, but it's phenomenally useful. And so I continue to do it. Um, so this brings me to like sort of hobbies and career. Like, you know, the, these things should not be as separate as we might think. Like, I love comic books. I'm a comic book geek. And I thought as a kid, that I would someday write my own comic books and that would be part of what I do for a living and do science in spare time as well. But, you know, turns out there's, a quite, there's not enough time in one lifetime for that. And but the skills I acquired along the way randomly have come in useful. Um, and so my hobbies now tend to be more in the realm of uh, do a lot of cooking and baking. I, I 
a lot of time doing martial arts, waving swords around, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, just general fun things. And then but I try to let things cross pollinate whenever they do. If I see something somewhere that's useful in another place, I take it and use it. Um, and so this brings me to like how I run my lab and what it's about. Like we, yes, we're ostensibly a cardiac lab, but we have a whole bunch of microscopy tools. We do a lot of different types of light microscopy, which means why don't we do other problems? Of course we will. If there's an interesting image to be had, we'll shoot a laser into anything. Right, so we do some neuroscience, we do some cancer research. It's based on microscopy expertise gleaned doing the cardiac research. We build image analysis programs, we're happy to use it for any purpose. It doesn't even have to be image analysis. It could be data of any other type. Um, that is, those economies, those efficiencies have been the story of my life. Taking things from one place and using it in another. I kid you not, there are things I've learned while baking cookies that have come in handy in the lab. Um, and so this goes to how I hire people, right? So I hire people in two different ways. One, I'm hiring people for my research group, um, or as faculty member in the VMA department and the Heart and Lung Institute here, I often get pulled into interviewing candidates um, for various campus positions. They could be like the directors of one of the um, late microscopy core facilities or technical staff there, uh, fellow faculty members, things like that. And there are obviously position specific considerations that come into play. Like if you're gonna be a director of a microscopy institute, I'm looking for a lot of leadership potential and still demonstrated leadership ability. Whereas maybe if you're joining the lab as a grad student or a postdoc, that is not as big a priority, but there are some things I always look for in anybody that should be hired into any position. One, I wanna know that they have some level of planning and how they approach everything, including life. The question I always ask is, what's your plan for the next 12 months, three years, and 10 years? I don't, I want to see planning, but I also want to see flexibility, but I want to see that they're thinking on different time scales. I want to see signs of original thought, um, because that's going to make anybody more effective at what they do, no matter what the role. And I want to see a certain level of fearlessness, right? Like, I don't, and particularly for academic hires, like into grad student or postdoc positions, they might not have any relevant skills. I don't always worry about that because these are positions where you're here to learn these skills. But I want to know that the person is not afraid of going into new waters and being a rookie in some other space. Um, those characteristics and curiosity is super, super critical to me. If the person doesn't show signs of curiosity, they're, at least for most of the roles, I tend to be on the other side of the desk hiring, they are not going to be a good fit. Um, and the last, but absolutely not the least part of it is I only work with nice people. If, if the person across the desk rubs me is like, this person might create conflict on the team or not be nice and helpful to teammates, yeah, they're not getting hired, right? Like we want a collegial team. We want people to help each other before somebody even asks for help teammate should run over and say, hey, can I help? Like that's the attitude we want on my teams especially. And so I look for that. That is absolutely critical. Uh, so I'll stop rambling right around here and move mm -hmm. on. Thanks, Sai. Thank you so much for that. Um, before we move on to some uh, practice with our panelists, I want to see if any of our attendees have any questions, either virtually or here in person. I'm curious, what field are you all interested in? Are you focusing more towards industry, academia? Are you looking for uh, government, more national lab uh, type careers? You can also say, I don't know. If you don't know, people. yeah, that's fine Those too. I still don't know myself. Yeah, if you're online, just go ahead and you can post that in the chat what you're interested in kind of looking at, what kind of careers. Okay, in person, Alejandro. Uh, I people I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, National Lab and Academia, I guess. Um, looking for postdocs to get out of the state to work in National Lab. I want to stay in research. i not as interested in industry because most times as my process for QA or quality, you know, and that's what I want to avoid at all costs. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, <laughs> no, knowing what you want to avoid is huge, and it is a very, very good thing. I, I'm terrified of biology. My whole career has been running away from biology, doing physiology right at the borderlands where it's still physics. And I still have a career. So. Scare me, because I'd say I keep avoiding anything with carbon in it. <laughs> <laughs> Rich, did you have uh, did you have something to, to input? It seems like maybe you did. Yeah, so one of the things uh, talking about a postdoc, right? Uh, most postdocs are focused on an academic career after their postdoc. Um, I have known postdocs that have gone on to industry just to test the waters for a year or two and then jump back into academia. So, you know, there's an advantage to learn a skill set in industry or a technological advantage. Coming back to academia is always a possibility as well. So. So don't limit yourself is what you're saying, right? Be open right. to all opportunities. Yep. Any experience you gain in the field is just going to help propel you on your next career, wherever you want to go. If I can add two quick points to what Rich said, I couldn't agree more strongly. Right? It, it, think of the job not as a destination, but as a tool mm -hmm. to get you to where you want to go. And define your destination by two things. What kind of week do you want to have on average in your work life? And what kind of impact do you want to leave when you get done working in whatever field you're working? And any job, anything is just a tool to get you closer to those two things. The ideal work week and the ideal impact. The end of the Any other questions on online? It seemed pretty quiet online. Okay, I wasn't sure if those three were from attendees or unless there's some specific but yeah. The other thing I'd like to offer too um, is I've seen a lot of industry that are interested in bachelor level um, candidates. Um, I've seen companies that are hungry for employees uh, with that level of experience all the way up to the PhD as well. Um, so to those that can go out and get a PhD and do a postdoc, um, you know, I'm proud of you that you guys have that skill set. Um, for those that don't want to go that far in their academic career, there are opportunities out there for you as well. Um, going back to showing the experience, the taking some initiative and showing a little bit of ambition. Um, don't let your degree of education limit you from those other opportunities in the career field. Sorry, everyone online. I think it's fixed now. You should be able to put things in the chat. It's not like the chat is stale a little bit, but yeah, go ahead, guys. I was just going to say, I agree with Rich uh, 100%. We do have positions at the bachelor's level. Um, but, you know, as Rich mentioned before, when you're interviewing, um, you know, show show your personality, ask questions about the team culture and make sure it's a good fit for you. But it's we are willing to train with someone who has a great personality, who is uh, who will work well with the team, who wants to learn, who wants to find solutions, who has that drive, who has that passion. We may have, uh, you know, a, a PhD or a master's listed, but that attitude and that drive will take you so far. And if we have the capability, we will change the education requirements to hire the right person. We know in the long run that 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 is more important, that culture, that drive, that passion is more important sometimes than um, than a degree for certain positions, obviously. Um, but I agree 100 percent. And as far as, you know, if you're not completely sure on what you want to do, ask questions. Um, you should have questions prepared for your interviews anyway, but ask a lot of questions, ask them about their day to day, ask them what they like, what they dislike. Um, and, uh, and through their answers, you're going to find, oh yes, I like that. That's exciting. Or no, I don't want to do that. And that'll help define where you want to go if you're not completely sure. Um, Thanks, Amanda. I, I actually did not I did not know that, that you could just uh, apply for a position that might have a required degree above what your what yours is, um, and that might change um, that might change what the hiring manager uh, allows. 
Not always. It depends on the team, what the needs are, and um, and the position. And we do have you know protocol and compliance we have to follow when we make those changes. Um, but it sometimes is a possibility. Um, you know, we'll put that. You know, I'm going to go with it again. That unicorn list on there, and that unicorn may be you know a, a PhD with these you know seven um, seven skill sets. But when we have conversations with our hiring managers, those first meetings of, okay, what do you want? What is your ideal? What is your bare minimum? Sometimes that bare minimum may be a little bit lower than what's on the job description. Again, that's for at least for talent acquisition. That is our job to go through. We know what that bare minimum is. We know what the ideal is. And we're, that's our job to be able to assess that looking at your resume if it's not a fit, you'll get the email of, I'm sorry, we're not proceeding, but it doesn't hurt to try. It, it, it's, you never know. Um, again, that completely <laughs> is determined on the position, the team. Sometimes we do need the higher level of education, but again, I would apply anyway. It, it doesn't always hurt. And that uh, passion and drive um, and teaming mentality will take you far. That's something, again, I, I, I've seen a lot of statistics that indicate that women and minority candidates tend to look for a much higher degree of match between their resume and the ideal candidate as described in the call out before applying compared to the general applicant. So be more, like, if you think you could learn the job and do it, apply for it. I can't agree more with Amanda. Everything is, yeah, that's super important. I'm so glad you brought that up because that is something that um, I, I've seen a ton of research on that as well. And women feel like they have to check 11 or 12 out of the 10 boxes before they will apply. Don't do that. <laughs> if, if you hit five or six, apply. Um, I, I don't know why that is, but um, it, it, I think women let a lot of opportunities pass because they don't feel like they're qualified. Let us make that decision. You, that's you don't know the insides. You don't know the bare minimums. Let us make those calls. Apply. CJ. Yeah, I was going to say that you know I I echo the sentiments, the responses of Amanda and Rich. Um, uh, my feedback would be that, uh, and I heard this during the Eminem conference when I was speaking to some of the students there was that I don't have the, the experience. And so um, what I would encourage uh, the listeners is to identify um, some of those transferable skills and what you're doing right now. So if your main focus at a PhD level is, is research, then you most likely have trained, you have most likely mentored, um, and those are skills that are transferable into a new position. And so don't underestimate the value that you could bring to organization. Uh, one of the things that you want to do for pre-work is to, is to um, really understand, review the job posting, and then also uh, do your research on the hiring manager. I think someone mentioned that as well. So that, that would be my, my feedback so far. Thanks guys. We do have one question in the chat. Um, and you can scroll back. Uh, all right, so the question, how would one go about finding uh, core facility positions, the NC main positions available the common LinkedIn zip recruiter role. I think this also could be a kind of a broadened question that I haven't talked about yet is where do you actually find those positions? I know like when I've looked for jobs as well, yeah, looked on LinkedIn, um, tried to look on different boards and stuff Indeed. to try to find them. And I think yeah. I applied for a ton of jobs where I never heard anything back from you're <laughs> like, I think I'm qualified for this, never heard back or got to from it. But where do you guys usually post stuff that's going to be applicable and where would you'll be looking for things. This person is specifically looking for something more core facility wise. Um, so where are your guys suggestions for different places to look? I guess what I'll say is like most core facilities on average tend to be understaffed rather than overstaffed, but that does not mean the positions are posted 
because the the system with the universities is such that we posting a position is what you do when you urgently need to recruit someone. But there's always this simmering background level of but if we found the right for this person, we'd open up a position and recruit, but we don't have the energy or the pressing need to go through the full recruitment effort right now in an urgent manner. So reach out to core facility directors on platforms like LinkedIn and just say, hey, this is what I'm looking for. Do you, does your facility or another one you know of need somebody with this kind of expertise or this kind of skill set? Uh, don't be afraid to knock on doors and ask. Uh, and don't feel bad about hearing no's, right? Like, just don't take it personally. Be quite kind of, you know, just Markovian in that, to use a mathematical term. So even if the job is not posted, send a send a letter of interest or resume anyway. Almost every job I have held was not posted at the time. I started talking to them and saying, here's what I do. You want to hire someone like me? And uh, yeah, some, it led to conversations. And it either plugged into an existing search or it opened up new searches. And these are common things that happen. And I've seen that happen for core facility directorships as well, or core positions. I guess for- Yeah, absolutely. Um, that. Go ahead, CJ. Yeah, I was going to say absolutely. That's, uh, that, that, that's the, the basis of, uh, of networking. You know, it's not always what you know, it's, it's who you know. And so uh, Amanda made a comment earlier about um, one of the leaders that she supports. And one thing that I did recognize at the m and conference was that uh, that leader uh, is, is widely uh, well known and, and networked. And so, you know, I, I do encourage you to leverage individuals that you know um, and, and to the other panelists' uh, statement, reach out to those individuals, even if you don't know them. The worst case scenario is no. Um, and so, you know, you have to put on your sales and marketing hat to market yourself, to sell yourself um, in, in all phases of, of, of before you even find that particular individual that you want to network to up into, up into uh, your, you getting that job. Um, and, and it actually does not stop there because once you're in that job and you want career progression, then you still are uh, selling yourself. You're still marketing yourself. You're creating, a, you're creating yourself, uh, creating a brand for yourself in the organization. So it doesn't stop. So, um, you know, networking is very valuable, and I encourage you to leverage the individuals that you have um, um, relationships with and build a relationship with those that you don't, that you foresee. Uh, that could possibly help you move your career forward. Yeah, I think any of these conferences, um, m and right near and dear to my heart, it's always a great place to network, talk to the vendors, uh, meet the other attendees who are part of these facilities. Um, I've, had been, I've had success with uh, connecting jobs on LinkedIn. Um, through uh, some former students that I instructed, uh, very nice. So it's their, the MSA job board. Um, I always look at that. I see um, many good positions open there. Um, I don't see a lot of field service engineer positions open on that job board, but I know all these companies are in dire need of field service engineers. And if you like fixing things and have a technical aptitude, um, you know, if you're a good computer person, you can build your own computer and you can go get a job with any of these vendors. Um, I think you could probably get hired tomorrow because I know I am sorely missing many service engineers at my facility. And it always seems um, that there is a week or two week backlog to get people here. Um, and I'm, maybe uh, Amanda or CJ, you could address that. You know, why don't we see more service engineers positions on the MSA website? I see them at your corporate websites, but not being promoted um, on the MSA job board. Uh, and it's funny sometimes, because I know a lot of companies that are desperate for service engineers don't promote there as well. You know, it's, um, but going back to the original point, 
so I can say, Rich, that uh, we we post all of our positions on our career site, and I can share that in, in, a, in during our breakout. I have a slide for that. Um, and Amanda, you may have to help me out with this one, but I think that the positions that we uh, post on LinkedIn are not only going to be the ones that are uh, hard to fill, where we are not finding the applicant pool uh, through our through our career page. Um, so I think that that could be a, that could be a possibility. So hopefully that answers your question. But we we are always in need of field service. Uh, engineers, field uh, service, uh, field application scientists, and then you will always find those uh, positions on our career site. And CJ, you have more FSE roles than I do. I don't have too many, so I'll refer to you on that one. <laughs> but um, but yes, by the time they they reach LinkedIn, those are where uh, pay attention and apply because we um, they're going to be positions that are a little bit harder to fill. We have uh, I've got a fit position, you know, that was mentioned earlier, and and, and we're struggling uh, finding the the right talent for that. So. Um, but uh, I, I would echo continue to uh, what was said before. I know I'm backtracking, but I just I, I feel like it's so important. Continue to network, continue to reach out. Um, that leader that was mentioned that I that I work with, we're already discussing positions for the first quarter of next year. Uh, so we're building a pipeline for that. Um, there are positions that never get posted because we've had that pipeline built already. So be part of that pipeline, reach out to them. If they don't respond to you, reach out to the next. Not everybody's really involved on LinkedIn. They may have a, uh, a profile, but they may not be as involved or check their, um, their messages as often. So reach out to the next, reach out to somebody you know, reach out to several people on the team. If you find an organization that you want to learn more about, continue to do that. Um, and uh, and we share, we share internally. Um, we get messages, especially with this particular team, they get messages all the time. It's not always a fit for what we have, but we this is a small community. Everybody knows everybody. And, um, and, and we do send sent these messages, these profiles to other people as well. So uh, network, network is, is incredibly important. And if it's not the right opportunity now, you never know. Maybe you make such a great impression a year or two from now, you get a message yourself of, hey, we have this position open now, we would love to talk. Um, so keep those options open, continue to, to reach out. And sorry to repeat, I just think I feel that's extremely important. And we love it. We, we absolutely love to be able to network with you guys as well. Yeah, MSA has their focus interest groups. So if you have a specific skill set that applies to one of those, join one of the FIGs. You're going to meet other people in that group as well. That's a great way to start networking. There's a facility managers group. There's a FIG group, Adam Pro group, whatever you're interested in doing, uh, they should have a FIG that will fit your skill set. Um, that's a great place to start networking as well. Um, the tech forum, uh, the MSA tech forum I'm part of, uh, Another great place we're looking for people to help volunteer, um, to help organize some of these events, have um, biannual meetings. Um, you know, there's a level of involvement that is will meet however much time you have to offer. If you want little involvement, just join as a member. Um, so there's lots of events uh, and other societies, groups within each one of these. Um, societies, whether it's MSA or MAS, that is a, another excellent area to start networking as well. I actually want to echo something you said, Rich. Uh, the MSA focused interest groups is especially um, a great place for students uh, to get involved, whether you are troubleshooting um, a technique that you're currently using or if there's a new technique that uh, you want to learn. These are small groups that meet, many of them meet regularly and are very receptive to um, technical questions. So uh, they're eager to help uh, young microscopists. So I highly suggest um, uh, joining one of them. If you happen to be a, an MSA student member, it's only $20 a year. And as part of that, you can join a focus interest group for free. So you have access to, um, as I said, uh, technical support in these groups. But uh, to echo all of our panelists, 
to a, another great networking uh, platform. Um, so I think before before I move on, I want to give everyone else uh, everyone a chance uh, to uh, I guess not final thoughts, but I would like to try to move on to the um, hands on practice. Does anyone have any, uh, I guess, mid workshop thoughts before we uh, start hands on more interactive portion? So, are we able to separate into different breakout rooms? Um, if not, well, we can. We could switch to online in person. Let's just start in person or okay. all together. Yeah. And then as it just we can move apart. Okay. So I know that's online has dropped off a little bit. So okay. let's, so let's just do it all together. And we can start we that can way start and then okay. and they all need to be able to go. So the overarching theme I've heard across government, industry, academia is that you guys, of course you're looking for technical skills, but um a lot of it is personality and drive and uh, what and work ethic. Um, but there seems, at least my superficial understanding in the differences between the three is that there are some nuanced uh, things that you guys look for in, in, your, in your potential hires. So resumes, for example, are mostly needed in industry, right? You don't, see that much in academia. Yeah, I would, I would be, be more interested in looking at CVs or like even in an NHL biosketch, the, the biggest permanent publication record. Okay. So my question then, I'm curious to hear from all the attendees, what do you guys want to practice first or see a demonstration of first? Uh, how do you put together, CVs seem pretty straightforward. You're just Throwing everything. Yes and no. Okay. But something Amanda said earlier bites on the CV front as well. Okay. If the first half page doesn't grab my attention, why would I read any of the rest of it? The first half page needs to scream off the page. It needs to show me who that person is, okay. not some generic formatting. And in that half page, it needs to come across why that person would be of interest in the context of the jobs I have to offer. I see. Okay, so there is some overlap in presentation for CV and resume. Even something as form rigorously formatted as an NIH biosketch, I probably have 10, 12 versions of it, depending on what the purpose is. Okay. So um, we've uh, suggested attendees bring their resumes if they want uh, some constructive feedback um, or practice their their elevator pitch to. Um, a potential employee well, while you're networking. They have just a few minutes to um, engage and even remember what you've said, if they're, if you're, especially if you're at a large conference and you're meeting a lot of people. So what is the uh, overall consensus, at least in person? What, what would you guys most uh, like to, to see demonstrated or practice first? Got a CPR resume you can tear apart right now. Okay. <laughs> I mean, like what? <laughs> okay. Do you have one? Uh, Do you want me to? I didn't. I didn't print it out. Were you gonna? Just it? No, I. Uh, I uh, I'm trying to. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> no worries. Um, Alejandro, sorry. Did yeah. you wanna? Did you wanna share it? Are you comfortable doing sure, that? Sure. All right. Let's bring it up here. Um, online. If uh, you guys wanna. Um, Dan, you want me to email this to you? Um, sure. Or, or you have a, I do not have a dumb drive. Or, yeah. And I don't oh. have a dongle. I have one. All right. I'll, I can that was up. Do you have um, HDMI? Yeah. Or, uh, In the meantime, um, folks online, do you have a preference? Is uh, looking at um, a resume critique a good start? Yes. Okay, I'll well, say that Maximilian yeah. speaks for everyone then. If you're in person, I'm gonna go get another donut. It's just longer. Okay. So if anyone else still wants to get more donuts? Let's bring more down a resume. Great, thanks, Brian. I like that. Wait, there were donuts if we were in person there. If you're in person, yeah. You should have made the drive, Rich. I didn't even know that. 
45 minute drive. I got enough donuts. There were sure some leftover as well. So if you drive over and back, you want to come to Columbus for the weekend. Yeah, if, uh, if Mr. Sparks is coming back here, send some donuts back with him. Oh, we do not need that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Greg. Yeah, Greg's here. Very on, right? So if Greg's going back to the base, send donuts with him. Dr. Sparks, I'm sorry. Um, while we're waiting, Amanda, you and I spoke briefly last week about the elevator pitch. I'd love for you to um, to repeat what you told me, that the elevator pitch is really meant for networking um, uh, platform, not when you're in a formal interview or meeting a, a, a hiring manager. Absolutely. Um, please, please, please do not do your elevator pitch when someone, when you start an interview and they say, okay, tell me about yourself or talk to me about your experience. Um, it, it, it's, it can come off very rehearsed and um, that's not the place. You definitely need one for networking. Any networking events, you absolutely have to have one and be perfected. Um, even that being said, make sure it doesn't sound rehearsed. I've talked to so many students where they come up and, and I'll say, hi, I'm Amanda, you know, nice to meet you. And then, blah, 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 and they just spill this, this pitch. <laughs> so add some personality to it, know the pitch backwards and forwards, but be able to adjust it um, to the audience and the situation that you're in. And please do not go through it with it during a, an interview. That's not the place. Um, it, it's, uh, it, we're, we're looking for someone who's real and relaxed, very, re take a deep breath and relax. That is probably the best advice I could give anyone in with an elevator pitch an interview, any of it, just take a breath and relax. Um, so it, things don't come spilling out very rehearsed. Is, uh, yeah. And my guess is that that comes with practice. I read many years ago, this guy had a job that he really enjoyed. He had no interest in finding a new job, but he would still apply an interview just to stay, uh, just to stay fresh and practiced in it, which I thought I'd never, it seems so obvious, but. Um, that, that's such a very good point. Yeah. I'm always doing things to keep my interview skills sharp. I'm looking for jobs right now. Okay. And I don't do it in a job related context because I don't want my employer thinking, oh, he's looking right. to leave, right? But do I talk to cab drivers about what I do organically working into the conversation and oh. seeing how engaged I can get them? I absolutely do. Okay. Do I test ideas on family members? I do. Just to see if I can get people engaged in what I want them to be engaged about. Okay. Yeah, that's clever. Okay, Alejandra, since you're back, I'm going to share your resume. Go for it. Um, all right. Okay, panelists, take it away. Make it so you can see the whole thing at once. Yep, I, I can see it. Go to 90%. 90%? Is the rest just publications and okay publications and presentations so yeah the skills and expertise that's what grabs me right away um hey you need a job <laughs> um so yeah i don't know if amanda or cj has anything to offer my question would be uh what i, I don't know what you want to do with um, I don't know what jobs you're looking for, what position you're looking for. I, I, I can, I understand your skills and expertise, your education, your work, work experience, but I don't, I don't understand what you want to do with all of this. So perhaps having a, a summary, uh, informing the reader of what you're looking for as a, as an option. Where would that go, CJ? The very top? Um, yeah, yeah, normally it, the summary is, 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 is at the top. Um, Another way you can, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Why, why do we need the, the purpose if we are applying to a specific job? <laughs> like if you're, if you're so pressed for time and real estate on a piece of paper, why do you need a purpose if I'm applying to a specific job? And I'm like, oh, I need the qualifications. 
to this and this. I mean, to, to me, it tells me that you understand what the job is. Okay. If the purpose is written right, it's like, oh, the person knows what the job is, that they're playing with good understanding and logic. Gotcha. Because we often do not look into it. I'll use a specific example. We're interviewing candidates for a lab manager position right now that involves a lot of mouse colony management. And we got a couple of candidates that on paper have some strong qualifications. We get in the interview and they're surprised to find out there's mouse colony management, even though that was in the job description. And they had no idea what we were talking about when we said mouse colony management. Gotcha. To say the interview ended in yeah. 10 minutes and that wasn't good. Gotcha. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Amanda, yeah, I, I echo that. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, CJ. Sorry. I, I, I echo that your 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 resume is your your uh, marketing collateral. Um, so uh, being able to um, express what what you're looking for and how you'll be able to make a contribution to uh, that position that you're applying to. Um, that would be my feedback. Uh, most some people have many resumes because they're interested or their skill sets allow them to be able to be flexible in, in different uh, fields. Um, so so you, you may not want to put a summary on all of your resumes, just really depends on how specific or general you want your resume to be. Um, I, I always recommend a specific resume for the position that you're applying to. I was yeah. kind of wondering how long should that actually be? Yeah. I don't think I've, I think when I applied for jobs, I've never added that in. That's a bad thing on my resume as well. But you said there's like seven seconds where someone's looking at a resume for. How long could that actually be for someone to actually look at it? I would keep it short and sweet. Very short and sweet. Um, I I may stand alone. That's not something that I necessarily look for um, on a resume. Um, but if I will tell you in positions that I've applied for in the past, if there was a, a job that I really wanted, I was extremely interested in, I would put a summary in there. I would make it, you know, two to three sentences, but really just right there, targeted, highlighted this is who I am, this is what I'm looking for, here is my experience to show you. You've got about two to three sentences to show them, I am the right person for this position and this is why. Um, so very targeted, short and sweet. You don't want a long paragraph on there because you're right, it, it's, it, we, we don't spend that much time until, our attention, it, until you catch our attention. Now, again, once you catch the attention, we will go through the resume in detail. Um, another way about that, uh, well, one thing with that that I see all the time, if you have a summary objective purpose, um, make sure it is correct for the job that you're applying for. <laughs> I, I see it all the time of, you know, somebody applying for maybe a, a field service engineer position, but they have sales in their objective or, well, I mean, there is some sales to that, but something completely different from what they applied for. That's an immediate, they're gone or, or cover letters. I cannot tell you how many cover letters I get where they don't update it, or they've got the wrong hiring manager in from the prior application that they had. Uh, <laughs> So I would, uh, my computer just went black. Uh, make sure it is updated. If you're going to include it, make sure it matches the job that you apply for. If you don't want to include it, send a personal email with your resume with a little bit, maybe you can get away with five or six sentences, a quick summary there, or a cover letter. Um, I don't always read cover letters all the way through, but I can tell you I have made a hire because of a fantastic cover letter that I saw probably eight years ago and I still today remember it. Uh, so there are some other variations that you can do with this as well, but you do want to find a way to say, I, I'm the perfect candidate for this position. This is why I want it. Here is my skill set. I have a question about cover letters. Uh, mm -hmm. So is it, is it uh, recommended to send it as an attachment or as a part of the body of the email about uh, the, the cover letter and how you're interested in the approach? Did you guys hear that question? The question was, uh, sorry. Yeah, the question was how to send the cover letter. Should it be an attachment to an email or as part of the application packet? Uh, and I guess that depends on what position you're applying to. And how you're applying, right? 
I will tell you, and this is something that I've been seeing more and more lately, they put their cover letter first and the resume follows. So it almost forces them to look at it because if it's a separate attachment, we may or may not look at it. Um, mm. Again, keep it short and sweet. Um, we don't want, you know, a three page cover letter, <laughs> but uh, you can put it ahead of your resume as the same attachment. Okay. Are there other questions online, Dan? Yeah, I saw a question. Where do you stand on having a picture on your resume? <laughs> Amanda. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't see the point. Like, I don't, I don't, I'm not put off by a picture being there, but I'm not, it's like, okay. You know, it's like, I, I ate seven donuts last week is equally relevant to me the, as the Eating picture. Donut. Amanda, you had a strong reaction, it looks like. <laughs> I agree. I don't know what purpose it serves. I, I it, it's not so much a, a put off. I just personally don't like it. Yeah, if talking about pictures, I'm going to go to your LinkedIn profile, and if I want to see a picture, I expect to see a picture there. Yeah, good point. I will say, a place where a picture made me look at a candidate and go, "I want to hire this person," it was not a picture of themselves. This was somebody whose business card was just an image they'd taken on a microscope and then on the back side was their name and a QR code. But the image was impressive, right? It was a hard image, well done. I was like, that's a badass candidate. I want that person on my team. They wanted to plant biology, which is a problem, but you know, <laughs> they're probably. Um, okay, so back to Alejandro's uh, resume, what stands yeah. out that, uh, that you guys like about it? Because that's helpful to know too, not just uh, what could be done better, but what was done well? The skills are number one. That's fantastic. I love that. That That's going to grab your attention right then and there. And you're going to be able to look and decipher, decipher if this is the right um, applicant for your particular role. You want that right up at the very front skills and how you can contribute any successes that you've had, depending on the role. Is that the primary thing that when you're taking seven to 15 seconds uh, scanning a resume, it, is it really the skills that catch your eye first and that you look for? Um, yes, I, me personally, and, I, and everyone else may disagree, but I'm looking for the skills first. I'm looking at their education and then I'm looking at longevity for each position and how, um, how many positions they have. That's kind of what I personally go through. But again, that's just me. Everybody else may have a different method. But th this might be my... Uh personal thing, but I agree with everything Amanda said, but before any of that, I look for fluff. And if there's fluff in the resume, help the pilot. What, what qualifies as fluff? Don't fill the page with unnecessary words, right? Like don't talk to me about like, I am phenomenal with Microsoft Word, a whole paragraph on, uh, out the window. You could be the best microscopist on the planet, but I haven't read anything beyond that. Rich, you were nodding your head uh, to what Amanda was saying. I'm wondering if you want to elaborate on anything. No, I agree with Amanda. Yeah, that skills and expertise, that's the first thing I'm going to look at. Uh, you tell me you know, that shows that uh, it's matching, hopefully, my job application, wherever it was posted. Um, so yeah, seeing that you have TM, TIV experience, all right, yep, I'm going to read more. That's my catch. Um, and so speaking of the fluff, you know, I'd like to see the fluff in the cover letter, right? I and mean, that's the chance where you demonstrate your writing skills and, you know, what you're doing to promote or sell yourself. Yeah, I will say like a resume like this, I really like the fact that it gets straight to the heart of the matter. Uh, one suggestion I would have, and I don't know if this is applicable for all the different positions, but Tell me why any of these line items is on here a little bit. A few words about, like, especially if you have a middle authorship on a paper, tell me what your contribution was. So it's like, oh, that's why they put it on here, right? Like, that gives me sort of context, and it isolates or highlights what that person brought to the table in that larger venture. And it also, in what they choose to highlight, I will often get a sense for, does this person, A, understand the job, or are they a good fit for the job? I guess along those lines, then I have a follow up question. If, um, let's see. I'm, I'm guessing, Alejandro, you've listed here all of your publications, no. right? Oh, those are, that's not all. No, that's, that's not everything. Okay. 
No, the throne needs first stop there and add it. Okay, so then if you do want to limit it, if you do want to cater it to each job, uh, would he then maybe pick three maximum publications that are most relevant and then? It's flexible, right? Make, make the space work for you is all I'm saying. Yeah, I think the publications are important for specific positions, especially if you're first author or even second author. Um, but again, uh, what the previous uh, panelist mentioned, use use it according to um, the length of how you want your your resume. But I also think that you know the publications and presentations on here are are absolutely great. Um, because it says that you're you're a leader, you're not afraid to being out in front of a in front of a group of, be, of people and being able to present. So especially if you're going to be in a customer facing position, this um, that would be a good experience uh, to um, to have on your your resume and then translate that in the interviewing process. Interesting. I I spoke with someone uh, not too long ago about the differences between applying for an industry and an acad uh, academic position. And their experience, their personal experience during the industry interviews was that the interviewers could, could have cared less about their publications. So I'm wondering, is that still something important to add on your list to include in your resume? I think it depends on the position um, because if your interviewers are um, are, are are in the same industry that 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 that, that you're in currently, or academic um, a field that you're in, then they're going to you know geek out over that. Um, and so uh, again, it just really depends on the position that you're applying to, and then uh, and then the audience that uh, that's going to read your your resume. Okay. I had a hiring manager yesterday. I was sharing a resume with him um, on Teams, and he, I was moving through the resume, and uh, we went through all of the experience. He said, "Okay, let me see the publications," and he spent some time looking at it. So I, I agree with CJ. If the, if the uh, position calls for it, definitely put it on there, even for industry. Okay, good to know. Um, any other questions on online? There's a question with, about LinkedIn. Um, okay. So yeah, I guess we talked about that a little bit. Is um, I assume we talked about the photo on there. LinkedIn got brought up, right? So someone was asking, how important do you feel a LinkedIn profile is for being hired? Mm -hmm. I think there was a question about LinkedIn. Um, oh, did you get that just, question? Yeah, didn't hear it, but can I just make one more uh, comment about Alejandro's uh, resume? Yes, um, yes, you know, formatting is 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 key, um, and then being uh, because uh, that that reflects you know a level of detail orientedness. So just having everything uh, aesthetically pleasing to the eye, um, and then also your um, your font. Don't have too many different fonts. This is uh, this is well formatted. Um, there's I can see at least three different fonts, uh, which is not confusing. Uh, it, 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 it reads well, um, and it doesn't seem like there's a lot of fluff or garble in here. It's all of, um, uh, substantive uh, information that I can take away to say, hey, yes, this person is is is, is possibly a good fit uh, for the skills that we're looking for. The position that we have open. Thanks, CJ. I'd, I'd like to know where you stand on, like, uh, including publications which are in preparation or submitted. Uh, should those be included? Uh, what makes me that? So, from from my perspective, you can put those in, especially if they are already submitted. In, in, oh, the question was, uh, what is the uh, feeling about including publications that are either you know, under review or in submission or somewhere in preparation stage, they're not accepted yet. Um, then you can add them, but in general, my thought is, and I know this, you know, the earlier you are in your career, the harder this, harder this rule is to apply, but 
choose the papers you put on there because they matter for the job you are applying for, right? There are, to, to use my lab's research as an example, sometimes certain students might hi highlight a certain paper because, oh, it led to a clinical trial for a new drug and I'm applying to a, a pharma company, they will care about that. But the imaging in that was stump standard. So if they're applying to an imaging position, that paper goes out the window, gets replaced with something where the imaging is cooler, something new was done. It's sort of what is it doing on the page to get you the job is the filter for me. Do the other panelists have any feelings on in process publications being listed? Does it take seven seconds to look at a publication? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Like, if, if it, I mean, for industry, what does it matter for the publications other than to show that you published? It needs its obligatory inch space that we need. But it depends on the industry position. That's true. It but also helps right. us. It helps us to see your expertise and, and, and where you excel as well. So it is something that we do look at. Um, maybe not always as maybe not as in depth um, as academia, but um, it does. You know, if I if the skills aren't outlined real well, I will go down and look at the publications to try to find those skills there. Um, so it, it does make a difference. Everyone's going to be a little, little different on um, how important that is. Some of my hiring managers love it. Some of them, it is seven seconds. <laughs> so it, it depends. <laughs> Amanda, CJ, okay. maybe you can exactly. answer this. Sorry, Rich, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> so looking at the publication list, you know, if I was applying for an academic position, I might have my DOI listing for each one of those papers. How important is it to have it on there? It seems like a duplicate. You already have the paper on there. And I can just cut and paste that and go to that paper. Um, is that important for you guys to see that hyperlink? I think some of my hiring managers would appreciate it. Me personally, not as much because I'm not a micro, micro, oh my gosh, I can't even say it. I don't do what you guys do. Um, <laughs> wow, <laughs> it's already been a long morning. Uh, so me personally, not as much, um, but it, I know hiring managers, um, if they have the time, they will definitely go and take a look. Probably not as important on, on our side though. Uh, Dan, you wanted to- Yeah, I'm the submitted one, I think. I've never, when I was applying for stuff, I never included those. I thought it fell somewhat under fluff. Um, but I'm wondering from actually the hiring people side, if you look at that and it says submitted or something, uh, do you take that into account much or is it kind of thought of and with respect? Like, somebody's going out for like a nature or cell publication, it might be in review for two years, right? For them to list that on the CV as something in process, totally acceptable. But don't do it willy nilly. Like it has to be carefully thought out, and it, like it's it's. I would be more cautious putting that on there than a published paper. But it doesn't matter whether it's published or not. The the first rule is, does it belong on that page for that purpose? Um, okay, we have uh, another question uh, from Brian online. Would a teaching experience section help when applying to something like an industry scientist position or maybe a lab manager position um, or is that best left out? Uh, maybe Sai, we'll start with you. I know teaching is probably most important in academia, but for the jobs Brian specifically laid out, like a lab manager position, what? It, it depends. With a lab manager position, we could be hiring for somebody who might have responsibilities training other people. So then, yes, that will matter to some extent. And also maybe a core facility lab. Absolutely. Facility. But in all these, it's also, when you say teaching experience, what kind was it? Did you design curriculum? Did you only teach? Did you get evaluated? What can you say in tangible terms about the quality of the work that makes it valuable to me? Because just saying I've taught, like, okay, you know, I, I've taught also, but doesn't say anything about the quality of the relevance. How important is that in uh, in government or national labs and also in industry? 
Rich, uh, I'll let you go first. Uh, yeah, it's, I think um, having that listed uh, is great. It shows that you can communicate to a large group. Um, you know, any sort of uh, what community type service like teaching, right? Just a general uh, broad description, I guess. Um, seeing volunteer experience, uh, members of being being a member of any sort of professional society. Uh, if it fits within this one page, um, you know, it's all stuff that I will look at and take into consideration. Um, it's nice to see the publications, the most high impactful publications that you have. Um, the presentations, uh, maybe, you know, I can go back and look at the proceedings, but I can't see the content of any of those presentations. But knowing that they're there, I may ask to see, well, show me that presentation. So, um, but yeah, having that teaching experience on there, community outreach, uh, I will look at, and that's one of my evaluation criteria. CJ and Amanda, I guess in industry, would teaching experience be a transferable skill to like what Rich said, uh, shows communication across uh, levels of expertise? Um, I think it's it's the same thing that's been discussed. It depends on the role. Um, I mean, I have an application scientist role where part of it is teaching. It's teaching customers uh, the instruments and the techniques that are used. Um, so it, it's it's something good to see. It shows that they have good communication skills. It shows that they're not afraid of, uh, you know, speaking in front of others. That they can, um, that, that they have that um, that component that we're looking for. But again, it, I think it just depends on the position for those application scientist positions. Absolutely. For um, I don't know, CJ, you can speak to this more, but for more of our application development, I mean, it, it doesn't hurt because again, it shows that they can speak to people, which we translate as they can speak to customers, but I wouldn't put as heavy of an emphasis on that type of role as I would on an application scientist who's going out to customer sites to, to educate, teach, demonstrate um, on the instruments and the techniques. Yeah, most definitely. I echo everything you say, uh, Amanda. Uh, I, I think that uh, it's not necessary to have a teaching experience section. Um, it would fold into the work experience um, as a bullet. And then in the interviewing process, you can speak to how uh, you how your um, your your message was delivered um, and some of the results from your training. So uh, did you have to repeat the training to certain individuals um, and, and speak to why and, 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 and possibly um, um, sharing of your presentation slides as, 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 Rich, as Rich mentioned, but I echo everything that Amanda stated. If I can add one broad point that kind of connects to a lot of the things we've talked about, but I keep saying, like, you know, what belongs on the page, I think of them in two terms, right? One is what is going to convince the other person that I'm a good fit for this job? That if there were no other candidates, this is the basic information that would get me hired. Then the second tier is okay, now there are other candidates who might also be qualified. What's going to separate me from the pack and put me ahead of the competition? That's the second level of uh, material. But if the first level fails, the second level is immaterial. It is pointless. So first focus is, is build that picture of, yeah, I am a candidate who fits this role, who you can hire for this and will be good at it. Second tier is, why should you hire me but more than the next person in line? Okay. Well, um, thank you all so much for your, for your invaluable input. Um, I didn't realize what time it was uh, until just now. We have two minutes left. Time flew by, but I would like to I would like to take just a brief moment since uh, we weren't able to go practice a 30, 30 second elevator pitch. What's the recipe for a good one that we can let the attendees walk away with and, and attempt to put to, to put one together?
my two word of a bit of advice, plain language, okay. avoid jargon. Okay. Even when speaking to- You never know, like, never. because there's all, with jargon, there's a risk of if they don't understand it, your word did not do a job for yeah. you. Okay. So that's the first ingredient, no, <laughs> no jargon. Well, I, I would, I will almost um, disagree. Uh, use jargon if you know that individual is in is in your field. If they're not in your field, then definitely don't use the jargon because they won't know what you're speaking about. But so just in as in a resume. That, sorry, CJ. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Would you Would you say? I, I was just thinking. So just as in a resume, your 30 second elevator pitch uh, is tailored to. You might have several different versions, right? Okay. I guess the qualifiers pick the words that you can be fairly certain the other party will understand. You, if you make the person listening to you feel stupid, you're done. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Brief, brief, and compelling. Um, okay. Yeah, brief and compelling. You have 60 seconds to sell yourself. So, brief and compelling. Um, speaking about your your proficiency that you learned, your you, you, what you've acquired, your abilities, and how you uh, applied that knowledge and that skill, and then also within that 60 seconds, um, you know, uh, stating where you are right now and where you foresee yourself to go in the future. Amanda, um, be real. So. I think that would be one of my, my, my biggest tips on this one, uh, relax, breathe, be real. Um, so I, I worked with an organization. We hired um, a, a finance individuals and a lot of sales individuals, and we hired straight out of colleges quite a bit. And uh, this was years and years ago, but um, I remember they would have them go through their pitch over and over and over again. So they knew it backwards, forwards, up, down, left, right, whatever it was. And, and I remember thinking, well, I don't like that because then it comes off so rehearsed and you just go into your spiel. But as I saw them, I went to networking events with them. I saw how that works and I highly suggest that have it memorized. So when you're in a, in a situation where you're networking, especially if you're new to this, you're going to be nervous and it's going to evaporate. You're going to forget all of it. So if you have that memorized, it, it's, it, it's just the, the mind memory, it, it will take over and, and you'll be able to give your, your pitch. Just make sure that it doesn't sound rehearsed. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, I've, I've talked to people of, you know, hi, how are you? What is your name? What, you know, what brings you here? And it's, uh, blah, 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 blah. I mean, they just go into it so fast, so quick, and there's no personality to it. So breathe, add your personality to it, memorize it um, so you can always fall back on it if, if the nerves kick in. Yeah, I can add to that too. Have someone videotape it so you can see yourself, you know, as you're watching it. How am I speaking? Am I speaking slow enough or am I speaking too fast? Uh, you know, you start seeing little things that are good points for good communication. Um, and to add to that too, I know certain universities have audio visual departments that will record you while you're giving a presentation. So how am I presenting? It's the same style. How are you holding yourself? You know, I think these are all excellent ways to help improve that elevator pitch. Great, thank you guys so much. Um, Dan, any closing thoughts? Yep. I just want to say thanks again. Um, I know we're out of time. I won't take up any more panelists time for anything, yeah. but um, we can set up a follow up. I don't know if you guys are open to talking with anyone that was on there. Um, offline, let us know. We could send out your contact information a little bit as well. Um, let us know if you are available for that. We can send that out. Um, and if people are interested in time, that, we can definitely connect um, you guys together. So yeah, thanks again for everyone showing up. Um, Thank you all. That was fun. Thank you to the attendees. Thanks. Thank you guys for the invitation. Thank you for having thanks, us. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.